Well, that's a good question. <laughs> um, the difference between overeating and addiction is problematic, to say the least. Um, Kent Barrage at the University of Michigan uh, put this in the realm of you know liking versus wanting versus needing. Now, obviously, we all need food to survive. That's very clear. And so some people say, how can you possibly have an addiction when you need something? So the question is, what does need mean? Um, certainly, from the survival standpoint, food is essential. So could you actually need be addicted because you need it? In other words, maybe we're all addicted to food. So here's a paradigm. Sex addicts. Okay? Do sex addicts need sex? Well, if you're an addict, you do. Do the rest of us need it? Well, the species needs it because otherwise the species dies out. But any individual probably only wants it. And when you go from wanting it to needing it, that makes you an addict, or so the cops say. So the question is, if you go from wanting something to needing something, could it be addictive? And the answer is yes, it can. And that's part of the issue. So can food be addictive? Yes. Is it automatically addictive? Are all foods addictive? And that's where things get a little more complicated. Uh, it appears when you actually look at the clinical and the empiric data, fat, salt are not addictive. Caffeine, no question, highly addictive, but non toxic, as well, at least unless you mix it with alcohol. And then you got four loco, and that's a problem. Sugar, sugar is sugar addictive, and the data are not totally in yet but uh, they are certainly pointing in that direction. In animal studies, slam dunk, addictive. In humans, there are some uh, problems with uh, trying to do these studies. There's no control group because no one's naive. Uh, there's f sugar in virtually everything, so it's almost impossible to clear out to assess the concept of uh, tolerance. And lastly, um, most people who are at least anecdotally addicted to sugar are mainlining it via the standard sugar delivery vehicle called a soda which is also high in caffeine so you have the overlay of caffeine so the question of whether sugar is truly addictive or not is still not answered but uh, there is lots of reason for concern Well, the, the area of the brain that is the reward center is called the nucleus accumbens. And the nucleus accumbens is where the dopamine signal is transduced to create the feeling of reward. And the sad part is that dopamine downregulates its own receptor. And that's on purpose uh, because what that does is it protects those neurons from overstimulation. The problem is that the more dopamine, the fewer receptors. The more dopamine, the fewer receptors. So every time you get a hit of something that's a substance of abuse, you downregulate those receptors. So you end up needing more and more to get less and less, and that's the phenomenon of tolerance. Does sugar do that? Absolutely. That we have hard and fast data on. Then the question is withdrawal. Now withdrawal is complicated, and um, we're not sure yet whether sugar actually causes withdrawal, if it's caffeine that causes withdrawal, is it withdrawal in some people, not in others? And the, other, the final question is, do you need withdrawal to classify somewhat, something as addictive? And the DSM-5 criteria now say that you do not need withdrawal. You need other phenomena that go along with it, demonstrating psychological and chemical dependency, but not necessarily withdrawal. So the definitions are changing. The this is a very complex question, and um, uh, I don't think we have the answer to it yet. No, not at all. There are a lot of people who consume large amounts of sugar who are not obese. If you look at the role of sugar in obesity, it adds about 0 0.8 
BMI points when you look at the meta-analyses of sugar, adding it or subtracting it from the diet. About 0 0.8 BMI points. We have a 7 to 8 BMI point problem. So on balance, sugar accounts for about 10% of the total weight gain. Sugar is a cause of obesity. It is not the cause of obesity. There are many causes of obesity. Pretty much anything that raises your insulin will drive weight gain. And there are other things other than dietary sugar that do that. So it is not at all surprising that sugar is not the, quote, big kahuna, if you will, in terms of driving weight gain and obesity per se. I don't care. That's not the issue. The issue is not obesity. It, obesity was never the issue. Metabolic syndrome is the issue because that's where the money goes. 75% of all healthcare costs are for chronic metabolic disease, and 75% of those costs are potentially recoupable if we could actually fix this problem. We wouldn't need health care reform if we could fix metabolic syndrome. Well, that's where sugar comes in. Sugar is uniquely, uniquely pathogenetic for the ph different diseases of metabolic syndrome irrespective of obesity, and it occurs in normal weight people as well. 20% of the obese population is metabolically normal. They will live a completely normal life, die at a completely normal age, not talk, cost the taxpayer a dime. They're just fat. Conversely, up to 40% of the normal weight population have the same metabolic diseases as do the obese. They get type 2 diabetes, they get hypertension, they get lipid problems, they get heart disease, they get cancer, they get dementia, all chronic metabolic diseases, and they're normal weight. Because those diseases are not dependent on weight. Obesity is a marker for the metabolic dysfunction, not the cause, and this is one of the things that has to change in terms of medical education and one of the things that I have been trying to espouse. Obesity is leptin resistance. They are synonymous. If your leptin worked right, you wouldn't be obese. Leptin tells your brain you've had enough. Leptin tells your brain you can burn energy at a normal rate. If your brain can't see its leptin, you're going to be hungrier because your brain is starving and you're going to eat more. And you're going to exercise less because your brain is telling your body to conserve. The only way to fix obesity is to make that leptin work again. That is absolutely paramount. And unfortunately, eating less doesn't do it, because what that does is it adds leptin deficiency on top of leptin resistance. And that's why everyone's a recidivist. That's why diets and drugs don't work, is because they're not fixing the primary problem, which is leptin resistance. So the question is, what causes leptin resistance? And the answer to that, our work and work of many other basic science investigators now show that insulin specifically blocks leptin signaling. Insulin blocks leptin signaling at the brain to tell you to eat more. And insulin also blocks the sympathetic outflow that comes from normal leptin signaling which would normally tell you that you can release energy to burn. So the gluttony of the sloth are all being driven by the insulin, which inhibits leptin signaling. So you got to get the insulin down. When you get the insulin down, now your leptin works. When your leptin works, you can eat less, burn more, feel better, and the process reverses. This is what we do in our clinic every day. We, run a, we don't run an obesity clinic, we run an insulin reduction clinic. And we will get the insulin down any way we can. And there are lifestyle methods for doing it, the most important which is get rid of the sugar. There are pharmacological agents that we use, and finally, if necessary, surgery. We do all of these things, but we don't do them willy-nilly. We don't do them uh, casting a wide net. We do this with targeted therapy specifically to what the problem is. Why is the insulin high? What's making that happen? And we uh, go after that, and we have good success.